So the first uh, talk will, will be Chris. Uh, you can see here, he should be there, you should see him. And uh, I will shortly uh, introduce uh, Chris. So uh, Chris uh, is based in Australia. He's a director of uh, data and uh, algorithmic uh, ethnics uh, at uh, Insurance Australia Group. Um, Chris is passionate about using data, technology, and AI responsibly and encouraging others to do the same. Um, he is also an active member of both the Institute of Actuaries of Australia Data Analytic Committee and General Insurance Practice Committee. Chris, uh, you can go. You can go ahead. I'm going to share. Thanks and uh, he hello everyone. And uh, before I get started, I'd just like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which I sit and pay my respects to elders, past, present, and emerging, and uh, and thank the organisers for inviting me to uh, to give this talk. Um, so hopefully uh, my slides uh, can come up. There we go. Lovely. Okay. So AI ethics putting principles into practice. Uh, is what we're going to talk about for the next half hour or so. So if we go to the next page. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about just the topic in general, AI ethics. Why is it a topic that uh, people are getting enthusiastic about? What are the motivations for considering it? And what are some of the challenges that people are finding, particularly in uh, implementing some of the principles frameworks that are out there? We'll talk about some ethical failure modes and why they're different to traditional failure modes of uh, human-based operation to sort of motivate some of the... Uh, problems and the solutions that might be put forward. And then I'm going to take a bit of time to go through some guidance that the Australian Institute recently put out. And whilst that's uh, the Australian Institute uh, publishing to actuaries, it's also relevant to other people outside of the profession and uh, outside of Australia. So I thought that would be helpful to share. And I'll wrap up with some concluding thoughts based on my uh, experience of doing this in industry. And uh, hopefully we'll have a bit of time at the end for q and I'm going to talk quite fast so we can get through it and maybe have some nice questions at the end. So if we go to the next page, let's talk about the motivations and challenges. And again, next one. So the motivation for people personally is typically that they don't want to see these sorts of headlines based on uh, work or projects that they've been involved in. And these are all genuine headlines that I found. They're certainly not the only ones. There seems to be lots of uh, stories uh, more and more every day, every week of uh, AI and automated systems going wrong, causing detriment to people uh, and causing issues. Um, some more serious than others. There's a, a selection here. Uh, you know, the, the famous Amazon example of uh, trying to use AI in hiring, and that turned out to have gender bias and uh, was widely reported. Um, an earlier example of Microsoft's AI chatbot, Tay, from, from memory was the name of that thing, uh, which uh, went on Twitter and turned out to, to learn how to be racist quite quickly. Probably not uh, entirely what was... Uh, what was what they were aiming for in launching that product. Um, more seriously, locally in Australia, there's been a, a, a large scandal with so-called RoboDebt, um, and the minister had to get out and talk about this, including accusations of uh, people committing suicide as a result of this problem. Um, so, so a huge uh, issue here. And uh, closer to home in insurance, New Zealand, ACC, uh, quite sinister sounding privacy and profiling fears over secret software. Um, again, not a headline that people perhaps would have liked to have seen. So this is quite a nice risk management technique that I like to use to sort of get people to think about what could go wrong. Um, there's plenty of other examples out there of AI gone wrong. If you want to do a quick Google, you'll find some wonderful stories. And so people have been thinking around the world about what's causing these kind of problems and what can we do to um, stop them from happening? Because ultimately, um, People are going to look bad, potentially laws are going to get broken, and most importantly, customers and uh, people uh, outside of organizations are going to get negatively affected, and that's not something that anyone wants uh, to occur. So if we go to the next page, let's have a look at what's been happening around the world. So um, all over the world, there's been discussions of standards and things that could be done in this area. So if we start with uh, government and public sector, and I'll, I'll apologize, there's too many words on this slide. I wanted to give you uh, some links and things to follow if you want to read more about this uh, 
after this talk. So government and public sector, well, lots of countries have published uh, AI ethics principles, frameworks or similar, um, either governments or sort of supranational type bodies. Um, there's a nice summary through that link there that you can click on later, which compares and contrasts some of the main ones that can be found. Um, there's similarities in these frameworks, there's differences. It's good to sort of think about both. Um, I'm in Australia, so I should mention the Australian framework, which we have this Australian AI ethics framework that got published about a year ago by Department of Industry. Um, and uh, this being Singapore, we should mention what's in Singapore. So the MAS have put out the FEET principles and the privacy, I think privacy office, I forget what PDPC stands for, has issued the uh, model AI governance framework. There might be other things as well. I'm not 100% uh, familiar with Singapore, but certainly those are two things I'm aware of. Um, so there's plenty of things that have been published around the world uh, that try and deal with this uh, this this theme. Um, but it's not just governments, private sector's been uh, publishing things as well. Um, some companies, particularly big tech, have published their own frameworks. Google and Microsoft are the, probably the most well-known ones, but there's plenty of others out there. Others have not necessarily published their own frameworks, but are encouraging research. Facebook's done heaps in this area. And my employers also sponsored a local research institute, uh, Gradient Institute in Sydney, which, uh, which is worth having a look at if you're interested in this area. You can find that through the link there. Um, Academia's then done a few things. There's some dedicated conferences now to research on this area. There's a, a booming literature in AI ethics and uh, related topics. It's very cross-disciplinary and, uh, and there's lots being published every week, it seems, in this, uh, in this area. There's some big conferences now dedicated to the topic. There's usually streams at bigger events like NeurIPS as well. Um, and there's been some, you know, declarations and similar Montreal declarations, one of the earlier ones. There's been a few others since where people have got together and said, this is what we think responsibility looks like. We're going to sign up to do X, Y, Z. Um, that's often been led by either academia or, or not-for-profit type organizations. And uh, the professional bodies have gotten in on the act as well. IEEE uh, has produced loads in this area. That's a much bigger organization than most of the actuarial bodies. Um, so there, there's voluminous stuff you can read there if you want to. Um, it's, it's pretty good, uh, I'd recommend it. Um, and then the actuaries haven't been silent. The IFOA in the UK has uh, done a project with the Royal Statistical Society, uh, published a guide to ethical data science. Uh, SOA has published quite a quite a lengthy paper on this topic, and in Australia we've uh, published our own information note, which is informal guidance in this area. I'll go into that in a bit more depth later on. So there's plenty of stuff out there for you to look at if you're interested in the area, uh, and uh, you know links there if you want to read after this talk. So next page, please. Um, there are criticisms of these frameworks. Um, these are the main ones that I'm aware of. There's probably others as well, um, but certainly ones that I'm aware of and uh, sympathetic of. Um, firstly, that they're quite high level. So they're high level philosophical principles typically. Um, and so it's not necessarily clear what you do in the detail. You know, you might have a principle which says uh, respect fairness or autonomy or, or some such. But what exactly is that requiring you to do day to day as you build systems and put them into market? It's not entirely clear. And so there's a, a lack of a practical guidance uh, in most of these frameworks, which is a common criticism. Um, also, there's a proliferation. I just put a slide up with, uh, you know, a dozen links on it. There's plenty of others. Um, so of all these frameworks, you know, are some better than others? What should I pick? Do I have to pick the one that, you know, my country or my industry has issued? What if there's another one I think is better? These are common questions and there's not an obvious answer to them. Um, even once you've picked a framework, Within those principles, there's usually trade-offs. You often can't uh, achieve all of these things perfectly all of the time. So, you know, what should you do? Should you go to some midpoint? Should you pick one over another? Why? Um, if you go and ask your customers which one's more important, they might disagree. So, you know, who are you going to agree with and not? These are all uh, difficult questions to answer, but ones that you have to answer in, in uh, implementation. And within each principle, there's often lack of clarity as well. I've, I've written a paper with a colleague of mine on uh, definitions of fairness, which I've linked to there, which you can have a look at. Um, most of these frameworks have something like, you know, consider fairness or be fair in them. Um, but fairness is not a well-defined concept. There's a uh, budding literature on just that, uh, which we've summarized to some degree in that paper. Um, other principles have debates as well. So often you see things like explainability or interpretability, and, and these terms have um, inspired 
a lot of academic literature and debate on on what might exactly be intended. So there's a lack of clarity there as well. So it's not not entirely obvious what one should be doing uh, with these high level frameworks. Next page, please. Um, and again, so let's think about what what's going wrong then uh, in uh, in these systems. Next page. So. In traditional human decisions, we should probably start by thinking about uh, what could go wrong and then compare and contrast this with an automated system. So uh, this is very stylized, but hopefully helps illustrate the, uh, the, the concept. So a traditional human decision at scale, you've got this manager um, who wants to interact with a range of customers. And there's too many customers for this manager to do it on their own, right? So they're going to hire a team of, you know, it could be a hundred or a thousand or a million people, doesn't matter, some team to enable them to scale that customer interaction appropriately. Um, the manager's got a good idea about how that interaction should, uh, should go about, be it sales or claims or whatever else is being done. And my computer just died, there we go. Um, so uh, so the manager's got a good idea about how this can be done. He's got some goals he wants to meet. Um, and they can write a rule book that uh, instructs their team on how that interaction ought to, ought to come about. That might be scripts or business rules or other things, depending on the situation. And they take responsibility for those outcomes. This frontline team then is going to do all the customer interactions. Um, in theory, they're going to know what that rule book says and follow those rules, although that might not always happen. Um, and when the rule book's silent, uh, because the rule book can never be you know, 100% complete considering every situation that could possibly occur, they're gonna exercise some common sense, some discretion to uh, achieve the goals or aims set out, but uh, where the rules are silent. So there's some obvious failure modes, ethical failure modes that could occur in this traditional environment. You could have a rule book that itself is unethical, um, so the manager might have written something instructing their team to do something that's not appropriate. Um, that's a big risk um, and that one will scale. So is one that's worth uh, thinking about carefully. Um, but even if the rule book's ethical, the rules might not be followed and the discretion that this team could, uh, could use when the rules aren't clear or aren't present could also uh, cause problems. So there's some obvious things that could go wrong. If we go to the next page, we'll then think about how we've solved this traditionally. And usually it's something like a risk and compliance function, right? And they're gonna do three things here. They're going to advise on the content of this rule book. And if the rule book's found to be unethical, they're going to you know, tell the manager of this. If the manager's uh, you know, amenable to that feedback, he'll change it. If not, then the risk and compliance function usually has a role to escalate that outside of the manager's control to some board or audit function or, or otherwise to make sure that this risk gets managed properly. Um, and then day to day when the rule book's static, what the what this function is typically doing is checking what this frontline team's up to. So are they following the rules where the rules are clear and where there's discretion? Well, are we updating the rule book to include the situation that comes up from time to time? And is that discretion reasonable or are people doing things that are not appropriate? And so this is now controlling to some degree, maybe not perfectly, but to some degree, these failure modes that used to exist. And so this setup is pretty pretty uh, common in most places where you have a scaled customer interaction using human beings. Um, if we go to the next page, we'll then think about what this looks like when we uh, automate the process and maybe have AI or some sort of other process involved. So the manager's still got the same goals, right? He wants to um, scale this customer interaction, but not with people now, with computers. So he's going to ask his AI developers to program a computer to write the optimal rule book. He's not going to necessarily write the rule book himself. He's going to have some goals, maximize sales or keep customers happy or make money or whatever those goals are. And he's going to ask his AI devs to uh, automatically generate a rule book that this digital service will use as it interacts. That's basically what these models are, rule books essentially. Um, and then the digital service is going to go on and do that. Well, the AI devs themselves might not necessarily understand the industry that well. They might have little understanding of this sort of business context that the manager's got. They might be from elsewhere. Um, so they're really reliant on the manager specifying this problem accurately. And then this uh, digital service is just going to follow this rule book exactly as, as written, right? This AI model or automated system is just going to run. It's going to do exactly as, it's, uh, as the rules specify. There's no discretion. It's a computer. It doesn't have free will. It's just going to do uh, exactly what you tell it to do. 
Um, but from an automated rule book that's been generated by software, not by someone writing down the rules. And that's where some of the issues can occur. So we now have these new failure modes, which these uh, systems can uh, can give rise to. These This is not an exhaustive list by any means, but certainly some obvious things that could go wrong. So firstly, those goals that the manager had, well, they might have specified them in an imprecise way and then asked for an optimal rule book. So this can lead to a you know, a system that's gone too far or in the wrong direction. And so if the manager said maximize sales, maybe it's going to lead to mis-selling or cutting of prices down to zero, which possibly is not actually what they wanted to do. And so things can go in the wrong direction or too far. And maybe this causes problems. Um, the rule book itself might be unreadable, right? This is a complex model. The AI devs might have built a lovely deep learning model with, you know, 10 layers in it and no one can really know what's going on in the middle. Um, so that might cause problems if people can't actually challenge what's going on in the decision making process. In some decisions that can cause uh, significant issues. Um, the other thing to think about is human discretion. So we call that a problem with the old system, but it was also a, a useful feature because where the rule book wasn't clear, the humans could sort of massage what was going on and try and do the right thing. In this situation, there's no discretion. The computer is going to do exactly what it's told. And so this sort of smoothing agent that was there in the past is no longer present and maybe that causes issues. Uh, computers take things very literally and uh, and maybe that's not ideal in all situations. And any problems we get are gonna scale, right? This computer's um, exactly the same wherever it gets applied. And so if we get problems, they're gonna be problems everywhere very, very quickly. And so things can blow up very fast and cause uh, large problems when they would perhaps otherwise have been small. So. We've kind of solved this traditional compliance problem that we had with automation, but we've created a whole bunch of other things that now need managing. And traditional risk management techniques possibly aren't catering for some of these issues. So we need to think about what to do. Um, and this is, I would suggest, what's uh, what's giving rise to a lot of the problems that uh, the headlines we saw at the start uh, illustrate. Um, there are new types of risks and new types of failure modes that we haven't worked out how to manage adequately yet as society. So uh, these failures keep occurring. So next page, please. Uh, so the Australian Institute issues, has issued some guidance recently, uh, trying to give people practical steps as well as high level principles. As I said at the start, the, uh, the current guidance on this topic is generally quite high level principles, and that's great, but uh, it often doesn't tell you what to do in the detail when you're actually uh, doing things day to day. And so we try to include that as well. Uh, next page, please. So there's two real areas of guidance in this note. There's a link there at the bottom if you want to have a look at it. I'd uh, recommend it. Um, so there's uh, high level principles, which is our, our sort of synthesis of the uh, literature that we could see. Um, we haven't included everything that we've seen. It's uh, our, our views on what the most common, most important things are. You can add to this if you like, that's fine. Um, and we think this is probably going to be a fairly static list, but you know, saves you from a uh, long reading list if you want to get into this topic. You can take ours as a good starting point and then embellish it if you if you want to. Um, and then good practices is what we think is the real value add of this guidance. So this is here to address this flaw that I've talked about a few times now that we don't quite know what the principles mean in reality on the ground in a practical situation. So we're trying to give people more clear instructions and suggestions on what that might look like. Um, most members are probably doing this sort of stuff anyway, but most people I've spoken to have taken one or two things from this list of suggestions and uh, sort of nodded and said, yep, that's that's helpful. Hadn't quite thought of that before. Maybe we should be doing that as well. So we, we hope that most people are going to get something from this. And we think this is going to uh, evolve over time as good practice emerges in this area. So if we go to the next page, we'll outline quickly what those principles look like. I won't spend too long on this because they're all quite high level and the uh, value add is really in the uh, practices. But uh, most of these you'll see in other AI ethics frameworks with the exception of professionalism. The Institute being a professional body though, we thought it uh, made sense to have this as a separate principle. Um, so we've got, you know, improve well-being, make sure that you're, you know, improving the lot of people and not making things worse um, in general. Um, consider fairness, what does fairness mean? How does that apply to your system? Um, Respecting autonomy of people is something you often find in these frameworks. We've included this as well. So making sure that people have free choices where they should and you don't take choices away and what have you 
is always good to good to have. Automated systems involve data, so we should be responsible and use that data appropriately. There's a, a range of suggestions under that principle that we've uh, included. And then we need to think about when things go wrong. So who's accountable? Uh, what contestability might exist uh, for customers to say our decisions are not appropriate? And uh, what redress might be available when things have gone wrong? Should there be compensation or similar? Um, we're not claiming this is the correct list of principles. We just think it's a good place for people to start and hopefully helps you uh, start from something that's not a blank sheet of paper. Um, there's lots in the guidance note under this, but I don't have time to go into that today. So I encourage you to go and have a look and, uh, and see what we've said. If we go to the next page, we'll start talking about practices now. And with practices, what we've done is try to use the actuarial control cycle as a framework, because certainly most Australian actuaries learn this as they go through the training. I'm not sure about other, other systems at the moment. Um, so this is three steps. Uh, define the problem, design the solution, and, and usually it's called monitoring the results. I've tweaked it slightly and called it monitoring the solution, but the intent's kind of the same, a uh, monitoring sort of feedback step. Um, so we've tried to uh, align our guidance and suggestions to these three uh, stages of the uh, life cycle, if you like. Um, so the next page, we'll look at defining the problem. We have uh, outlined three points that we think are important to bear in mind here and, and things to do under them. Um, this is only a high level summary. There's lots more in the actual note. Um, but we need to first clearly define and document what the objective is. Um, often people aren't used to defining precise objectives. Your business leader might say they want to maximize sales, they want to grow, they want to make money, they want to keep customers happy, something you know amongst that list. Maybe they want to save expenses, something like that. Um, there's normally a high level, fairly vague business goal specified, but things might be a bit more subtle. And normally human beings can work out what that subtlety is, but a machine isn't going to do that. So we need to be a bit careful in defining the objective. Um, alongside that, we need to work out what the constraints are. So if my uh, if my um, executive or sponsor of a project says that I want to maximize sales, they don't literally mean they want to maximize sales at all costs, right? They don't mean that, uh, you know, mis-selling is fine. They don't mean that... Um, Computers seem to have gone wrong. I don't know if anyone can hear me anymore. I'm going to attempt something. I'll be back. I don't know if you lost me then for a second. All good? Okay, excellent. Sorry about that, everyone. Um, so, yes, constraints should be specified. Um, it doesn't mean um, you know, maximize sales at all costs or make money at all costs. There's going to be other objectives and constraints that we should uh, build into the system. If you don't tell your computer what the constraints are, there are no constraints. So you need to be very careful. Um, and you need to specify the domain that your system will uh, will apply in. A lot of problems occur because a system gets applied in a situation that hasn't been seen often before, and then things go you know horribly wrong from time to time. So uh, so let's make sure we're only applying our system in a situation that we're confident it's going to do appropriate things in, and uh, and not applying it in situations that we're not confident in. Um, and we need to do that as we define the problem. Um, the next step is designing the solution. If we go to the next page, we've got four things that we've outlined in our guidance note uh, at this stage. So uh, we need to make sure that we uh, translate that problem that we uh, defined up front accurately. And, and this is a um, perhaps not widely appreciated problem, but a common problem. Um, so most of the time our objective isn't quite specified exactly in the data that we have. We've got some data that's conveniently available, um, but it might not link precisely to the goal that we've got. And so if it's a proxy of some sorts, we can get translation errors and we might be solving a slightly different problem than what we set out to solve. And maybe that can cause problems. Certainly there's several examples of that uh, that have been seen. Um, so ensuring that accurate translation occurs or that if there's mistranslation that's managed appropriately is, is a useful thing to do. Um, we need to make sure we collect and use data appropriately. There are, are a laundry list of suggestions and points and things could, to consider in the guidance note, which I haven't uh, copy pasted onto the slide. It would be way too much. But the, the general theme is to go beyond privacy and security law. What's happening in this area is that people's expectations are increasing rapidly. And typically, legislation takes some time to keep up. And so if, you're, um, if your general conduct is to do what you're required to under the law or under the regulations, and that's your bar, some people are going to be 
not happy with that, they're going to find that unacceptable because cust customers' expectations might have moved on. So you need to have a lens of what people reasonably expect, and that might go uh, beyond what you're required to do, but uh, needs to be thought about. Um, then we need to think about building a model. So how's that model designed? What are the constraints of it? What assumptions have we made? What judgments have we made? Um, how have we considered fairness in uh, constructing that? So who's going to benefit? Who's going to miss out? Why is that okay? Um, all this needs to be well documented and justified and ideally signed off by your uh, responsible executive in a manner that they can understand. So this might be quite a complicated statistical thing. Your executive might not be a uh, st statistician or actuary or similar, uh, but they still need to understand what's going on um, because uh, they're going to be responsible for the outcomes of this system. Um, and the system in, in this situation is not just guiding what happens, it literally is what's happening. So we've got to be uh, quite careful. Um, transparency then. Transparency is a theme that often gets talked about. We should think about whether transparency is necessary. It's not always necessary for every system. Sometimes it actually makes things worse. It confuses people, too much information, what have you. But sometimes transparency is really important. So we should think about what level of transparency is appropriate for customers. And then internally in our organizations, um, to the point I just made, um, what level of transparency or understanding do people need to have over this system and how it works? Um, next page, please. Last step of the control cycle is monitoring. I've also put deployment into this because that didn't fit anywhere uh, else that was sensible. Um, so when you deploy a system, you need to make sure that it's deployed appropriately. Your responsible person signs off. Um, you know they properly agree to the deployment and that it's sensible, and that they, uh, you know, the, your deployment is. Uh, if it's as a stage approach from sort of development to production, then that at, at every stage you've done the proper checks and what have you. Um, then we think about performance triggers, right? When the system's going wrong or going off slightly from what we first intended, what, what do we do? And we should probably have some monitoring to make sure that uh, we're aware of when these things uh, occur. So if you've got a system that needs to be manually recalibrated, it just exists. It's a model that's there making decisions, but it's not going to change until you tell it to change. Um, then some, sometimes you can get drift and what have you that uh, that causes issues. So you need to make sure that there's performance triggers in place so that you know um, when your model's not quite doing what you first intended to do, maybe it's uh, out of date now, maybe something's changed in the environment, that you become aware of that. That could link to your constraints you set up or your objectives or other things that you think are relevant to monitor. And when those red lights go off, you have some actions that you've decided before you go into market, you're going to take. So when this red light goes off, I might stop my system and turn it off, or I might go and do a manual review, or I might um, you know, refresh things or what have you. There, there might be a range of options depending on what that, that light means, but you should specify that before you, uh, before you go, to go, to, go to market and things are in the wild. Um, then systems that autonomously recalibrate, so your sort of proper AI, if you like, it's changing and learning without any human interaction or involvement. Um, you need to think about what these systems could develop into. Otherwise, you get a chatbot that goes racist uh, on Twitter. And, uh, you know, if you don't intend that, then you probably should stop it getting there or be aware that it's going in that direction before it ends up there. So you need to define the boundaries of acceptable adaptation up front. And when it goes in that direction, maybe crosses those boundaries, again, triggers that tell you what to do. Turn it off, review it, refresh it, what have you. Um, so those sorts of monitoring uh, approaches that we think are quite sensible. Many people do these things. Um, hopefully others uh, will do that now we've suggested them. Um, record keeping is very important. Um, if your system requires explanations or audits or other sorts of things, then you need to make sure there's appropriate records there to um, keep track of what's happened and uh, make sure that you can act appropriately in future. So that's it. Um, next page, please. We'll talk about um, professionalism. So there's some embellishments here of the Australian Actuaries Code. I'm actually, in the interest of time, because we've not got that long left, going to skip over this, but there's uh, there's some stuff there that you can read um, separately, which just embellishes some of the comments in the Actuaries Code in this, uh, in this context. Um, so next page, please. Um, and so from my own experience in, in industry and talking to others in industry that are trying to do this, I, I had a few suggestions I wanted to, uh, to leave you with. So um, 
The first is uh, it's probably not wise to treat AI ethics or ethics of automated systems as an extension of your traditional privacy office or, or data governance sort of privacy type situation, which, which most companies have uh, fairly well established. Um, I have seen some places that have essentially said to the privacy officer, this involves data, uh, therefore you should probably just extend your remit to consider ethics of these systems as well. But the risks are really conduct related, the biggest ones. So if your system is making inappropriate decisions, um, that's quite different to, uh, to your traditional privacy uh, type risks. Uh, and so you probably want to think about a, a different model uh, than extending someone's job when it's already probably quite a full job um, and quite a specialized job. Um, I've written a paper on this a couple of years ago, which I, I didn't link here, but I'm quite happy to send around if people are interested. Um, contact me separately, that's fine. Um, so secondly, your, your second line needs to be really technically competent in this area. Okay, so your second line risk management function that's playing, you know, an advisory type role, typically to the first line, um, they need to really understand how these things are built and how they work. Um, so, sorry, can we just go back a sec? I'll be quick, don't worry. <laughs> um, so they need to understand how these things are working, how they're built, so, uh, so they can advise properly. And that might mean you need uh, different types of people in your second line to, to what you have already. Um, Ideally, you've got um, existing governance processes for customer facing decisions. And so it makes sense to leverage those wherever you can. You probably don't want to set up the separate AI ethics process. You want to leverage the existing governance process you've got for customer facing decisions. And often this gets applied, uh, these principles and what have you for new systems. That makes a lot of sense because there's uh, new things happening. But it also makes sense to go back and revisit some of your legacy systems, which might be more like business rules and what have you. But you can still approach them with the same sort of mindset and see if they're doing the right thing. Um, so last slide, please. Thank you. So look. Um, this is a big area of public discussion. The debate's not ended. It's ongoing. Um, there's lots of frameworks out there. They're generally pretty high level. So a lot of people are finding it hard to know what to do in practice. Um, this guidance from the Australian Institute that I've been involved in, in building does try to help with this. We don't claim it's perfect, but we hope that it's a good starting point that, uh, that helps people uh, build on. Uh, and this is version one, right? So go and have a look at it. If you think there's things that are missing or things that uh, could be improved, let me know. Very happy to take feedback and we will be improving this over time. Um, and my computer's doing something funny again. There we go, that's better. Um, uh, the last point I'll make is just that the practical steps that we've outlined, they look, I mean, these frameworks look like high level philosophical principles, typically the ones that have been published. And so, you know, unless you're a professor of philosophy, you, you probably look at some of these and you're not quite sure what some of them mean. Um, the practical steps, though, look a lot more like good governance and risk management. And so actuaries are probably in a bit more familiar territory. Um, so hopefully, I think this is a good place for actuaries to play a role, either in sort of first or second line risk functions or similar to make sure that uh, these systems are applied appropriately and uh, and are doing the right thing by, by the public. Um, that's all I've got to say. So happy to take any questions that people have. I don't know if any have come through the Q&A. Thank you. Doesn't look like it. I have a question, uh, Chris. Oh, you sure. have a small comment. You want to... Uh, we have a more comment and a question uh, regarding uh, the, 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 the person like the example comparing life manual manager versus AI solution. You want to comment uh, further on that? Oh, it's a stylized illustration I like to use to, uh, I guess, compare what we're doing um, with automated systems to a traditional environment where you try and scale, right? Because um, a, a lot of the time people look at, uh, you know, all this wonderful AI stuff and, and they think it's, uh, it's, it's totally new. But actually what you're trying to do is just scale an interaction with a sort of rule book of sorts. Um, you're just doing it in, a, in an automated way. But what you're doing is creating new types of risk. Um, but the, the risks are conduct risks typically. So making the wrong decisions, doing the wrong thing, uh, rather than 
that there are data and privacy risks and things like that. Um, but those are all pretty obvious. It tends to be what some people focus on, though. So I like to compare it to a traditional interaction because then people will usually uh, acknowledge that there are conduct risks there. And if we're making the same type of decision, uh, you know, if I'm replacing a call, a, a call center agent interaction with a digital interaction because it's on a website and that's got some AI model behind it, that conduct risk hasn't gone away. It's still there. Um, and so that needs to be acknowledged because that's uh, one of the biggest risks you've got. Okay, thanks. Um, That's I all right. A, I had a, a question regarding uh, uh, those uh, principal framework uh, for AI ethics, especially those coming from regulator or international bodies. Do we have uh, in those framework any incentive or even like any fees or punitive measure that can be taken? Uh, t typically not. I, I, I'm not sure. Um, the ones that I'm most aware of are all sort of voluntary. Um, so here's a framework. We think it's good. Sign up to it if you like. And, and most of these are acknowledged to be in the early stages and quite high level, right? So um, there's uh, consortia in some countries um, that are testing these things out in reality. Um, and so you expect to see over the next year or two, case studies and examples and maybe more detailed guidance in light of those coming out. Um, so I'm aware of a lot of uh, sort of consortia, either via industries or, or other sorts of bodies that are taking these principles and trying to work out what it means to apply them in practice. And sort of there's then a two-way discussion about what standards might look like. Um, so it's very fluid. And uh, I, I don't know of any of these that are, you know, required under law or regulation at this point, but I, I'm, I could be wrong. Okay, and maybe uh, another one uh, for for the remaining minute or two. Um, do you have an example, like in our in industry, maybe not in Australia, but maybe worldwide, where the application of uh, such principle had an impact business-wise with a, 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 an opportunity or, or, or some profit that we have missed due to, to such application? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, I, I'm just going to say, watch this space. Um, we'll hopefully have something uh, published um, sooner rather than later uh, in insurance, which we'll, we'll talk about this. Um, so, um, I don't know, follow me on LinkedIn and you'll see it sooner rather than later, hopefully. So it seems the answer is yes, but uh, we need to wait to know more. You need, you need to wait a little while, but it, it'll be there, don't worry. Uh, th there are things out there, though. That's just obviously something that I'm involved in. Uh, but... Um, Yes, there are things that you can you can look at. A lot of these consortia that are being put together are, are going to publish case studies and things like that. So, um, you know, if you follow um, any of the bodies that have published these things, there's stuff in Singapore, there's stuff in the EU, there's other sort of stuff. Um, a lot of them acknowledge that there are these groups uh, that are testing them and they're going to publish case studies and things like that. So it's worth following those. And then as case studies come out, you'll you'll see them first, hopefully. OK, thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, just right in time. And uh, right. you, you stay stay online uh, for, for the rest of the afternoon if you want to to, to listen to, thank you. to the next uh, of the day. Thank you. I will. Thank you for having me. I will just turn my video off. Thank you.